you could go back to your life before the trial and change anything, would you? I wouldn't change anything that's ever happened in my entire life. Nothing. Everything that has happened in my life has came together to create and make me the person that I am now. And if any of those things would change, then the person who I now am would not exist. Give up my personality, give up my identity. Just march along like everyone else. I'd rather die first. Believe it or not, it has been nearly three years since the last season of the Netflix mega hit Stranger Things. But now the gang from Hawkins, Indiana is back with their biggest season yet and what's being called the most terrifying villain of the series. Stranger Things season four seemed to use his pandemic delays very wisely and noticeably expanded the runtime, the cast, and number of storylines. Perhaps one of the best things it did was give us the gift that is Eddie Munson. In the very first episode, Munson quickly captures everyone's attention when he stands up to give an epic speech on the demonization of Dungeons and Dragons. To the game, saying it promotes satanic worship, ritual sacrifice, sodomy, suicide, and even murder. Sadly, we don't realize until later how much foreshadowing was contained in that speech. What makes Munson's story all the more tragic is that he is based on a real-life individual. The Stranger Things creators have confirmed that Munson was inspired by Damien Eccles. When Eccles was a teenager, he exhibited some similarities to Munson. While he wasn't a DND player, he was a bit of a misfit in his local Bible Bell community of West Memphis, Arkansas. He had a habit of dressing in black, was a huge fan of Metallica and heavy metal, was interested in the occult, and dabbled in Wicca. All of these things were as harmless as Munson's doings in Hawkins. Yet, these teenage interests would nearly cost Eccles his life when satanic panic broke out. Eccles is one of the West Memphis Three, a group of three teenagers who were controversially convicted of a triple homicide. In a statement given to the police and obtained by a Memphis newspaper, 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly allegedly confesses to watching two other suspects choke, rape, and sexually mutilate three West Memphis second graders. The murders had been part of a satanic ritual. Satanic worship. A horrific, ritualistic sacrifice. We're just sitting on the couch watching TV the night before arrested. On May 5, 1993, three eight-year-old boys, Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byer, went missing in West Memphis, Arkansas. Tragically, the boys' bodies were found the next day. The three had been tied up with their shoelaces, killed, and dumped near a creek in Robin Hood Hills. All three of them had died from multiple injuries. The triple homicide rattled the small town, as locals feared a murderer was now on the loose. That possibly this could have been going on while I was actually at work and I was so close to it, just, it, it's an eerie feeling inside. The investigation almost immediately honed in on Eccles, largely simply due to bias among the local authorities. Eccles was known to them, as he had been convicted of minor crimes such as shoplifting and burglary. He was a high school dropout, and social services visited his family frequently. However, it was largely Eccles' interest in the occult that detectives honed in on. Without much evidence, they decided that the triple homicide appeared to be a satanic ritual, and, in turn, Eccles must be involved due to his interest in the occult. So, going on only Eccles' interests, and no other evidence, the police began interviewing him within two days of the murder. While not even officially named as a suspect, Eccles was interviewed on numerous occasions, as the police continuously circled back to him. Eccles, at the time, was also close friends with Jesse Miscully Jr. Miscully and Eccles shared the same interests, and were both high school dropouts. The true tragedy of this case came when Miss Kelly was interrogated for 12 hours by police, despite his father not giving permission for the interrogation. Then uh, Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Michael uh, Moore took off running, so I chased him and grabbed him and held him to they got there. 
Ms. Skelly, during the grueling 12-hour interview, admitted to the crime and tied Eccles and another teenager, Jason Baldwin, to the murders, but quickly recanted his confession. He would continue to recant it and state that he didn't understand his Miranda rights and that he was afraid of the police. Unbelievably, his confession was still used as evidence and was largely the reason behind the conviction of the West Memphis Three. They were convicted of the murders and Miss Skelly and Baldwin were sentenced to life in prison. Eccles, though, was sentenced to death. It reads as follows. We the jury find Damien Eccles guilty of capital murder in the death of Stevie Branch. We the jury find Damien Eccles guilty of capital murder in the death of Chris Byers. We the jury find Damien Eccles guilty of capital murder in the death of Michael Moore. For 18 years, Baldwin and Miss Kelly remained in jail, while Eccles was placed in solitary confinement on death row. As the years went by, the conviction grew more and more unstable. For one, a major witness, Vicki Hutchison, who claimed Eccles had admitted to the murder, recanted her statement and admitted it was a complete lie she told in hopes of getting reward money. Second, DNA evidence was tested in 2007, and none of it tied any of the West Memphis Three to the scene. Third, of course, the entire conviction was based on a potentially coerced and false confession. 18 years, a long time behind bars, a long time on death row, a long time in and out of solitary, a long time for something that you insist you didn't do. Today, three men who were supposed to never walk free did just that. After years of fighting for freedom, they were released today in a very unusual plea deal. Aaron Moriarty. Finally, in 2011, the West Memphis Three accepted Alfred plea deals. Essentially, they asserted their innocence while admitting that the prosecutors had sufficient evidence to convict them in order to secure a deal to get out of prison. Of course, not all of them wanted to take the deals, but Eccles' life was literally on the line. They accepted the plea deals and were sentenced to the time they had already served over 18 years and thus set free. I've been on their side and I've been fighting for them hard since 2007 when I realized I was wrong and I had to make many amends to people, but I'm still standing and fighting for justice because they're innocent. They did not kill my son. To this day, it remains unknown who committed the triple homicide. However, there may soon come a day when new evidence completely pardons the West Memphis Three. Today, Eccles is 47 and is a writer. He is also married and the father of one child. In particular, he has written many books about the occult and how his spirituality saved him during his time on death row. What happened to Eccles, though, was nothing short of tragic. The sheer level of bias was simply outrageous, with the police immediately pinning the crime on Eccles, simply because they didn't like him. This bias was seen yet again when he was the only one of three sentenced to death. The mob was against Eccles from the start, and they were going to put him in jail with or without evidence. Kill a one to ten, how solid do you think the case is? 11. <laughs> Stranger Things has masterfully re-explored the case of the West Memphis Three through Munson. It adds new layers of tragedy to the case, as viewers concede how difficult it would be to see someone like Munson sentenced to death. He's practically a child who is lovable, and despite his interests, is completely harmless. Yet, when it came to mob mentality and satanic panic, it didn't matter if you were just a kid, or how harmless you actually were underneath some black clothes and heavy metal music. If you were caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, 